Thank you for having me today. This is um, wonderful, right after lunch in the cold weather. Um, the title of this talk is currently Collaboration Within and Across Teams, um, until Brian fixes it. Um, what I want to do is start by talking about why we're studying collaboration within and across teams. So if we take a typical um, task that we might be interested in using teams to solve, here's an oil spill, um, one that matters a lot to us in Orlando. And you imagine that sometimes tasks or a potential uh, impending pandemic bring about the need for mass scales of coordination, bigger than what we would typically get if we tried to study coordination among individuals working within a coherent team, or even within one organization working towards with multiple people aligned towards some organizational goal. So if we think about the response to this, we can look up at the top, there's an immediate multiple crews working on multiple ships that need to work together to abate the disaster. Um, there's a more slow pace recovery effort in terms of the cleanup operations. There's a command and control structure in place coordinating what's going on. Ultimately, we've got a situation where um, the organizational dynamics are much more complex than what we would typically study um, if we look at teams or organizations as a big So in terms of unit of analysis, right, in order for us to be able to answer the question, how do we make this system work? How do we get a bunch of people that have this important task to do on the same page working together so that they're ultimately successful at accomplishing that task. If we study the team, we get some rich dynamics and we can tap into a lot of literature about the types of cognitive architecture teams need to have. We can understand what the socio-emotional drivers of effectiveness are. Um, but unfortunately, it's not enough to just say teams are embedded in a context, right? Because oftentimes, when we create teams, we inadvertently create competition with teams with each other. And here's a situation where we need teams from different organizations and agencies, which oftentimes are not in a goal alignment situation, to come together and work together effectively. We also can't use the organizational lens in this case because we're dealing with a system that's not contained in an organization, right? We've got um, different organizations embedded in multiple different societies, even in people um, that need to come together. So we invoke this new unit of analysis. And what I'm going to talk about today is an Army Research Institute funded program of research that we've been working on for three years designed to explore this new unit of analysis in social science, which is the multi-team system. So by definition, a multi-team system is two or more teams that interface directly and interdependently in response to some environmental challenge towards the accomplishment of at least one collective ultimate goal. So a bunch of teams in an organization doesn't constitute a multi-team system. They have to be interdependent. There has to be a goal hierarchy that creates a sense of mutual alignment, where the ultimate goal isn't going to be realized without these teams working together. Another useful way to conceptualize them is as networks of teams, where there's patterning of interaction both within individual teams and also across teams. And so we set out to explore some of the key relationships that make multi-team systems effective. Some of the problems, you know, I, I framed this in terms of disaster response. Um, we can also think about provincial reconstruction, disease outbreak, uh, multinational joint planning, uh, humanitarian aid, creating knowledge and science teams. If anyone's ever been on a big science team with another lab, we know that sometimes those don't always go smoothly, right? You have this grand vision in mind, um, but there's a lot of challenges on the way to coming up with some creative, innovative um, piece of knowledge and your disaster response. So importantly, what all of these tasks share in common, which allows us to use this unit of analysis, is that there's this complex multi-layered goal structure where you have multiple teams that have some specialized expertise. Just like we create teams and organizations because there's some task that people need to combine either information or skill set, the same thing happens um, in a large scale task where different teams have different expertise. There's often multiple organizational boundaries that are shaping and constraining the behavior of individuals. And there's a mixed mode of interaction. So we said that everyone shares a common goal. But if we think about the cleanup efforts, certainly if we think about some of the environmental organizations in Florida, and we think about BP, 
their goals are aligned at some level, but they're also in competition um, in other levels. The way that we would like, and speaking now in terms of a native Floridian, the way that we would like um, the oil spill to happen is not necessarily in alignment um, with some other unit's goals. And lastly, they're distributed, right? This is a problem that social psychologists figured out an awful long time ago that you can't create big teams, right? Past a point because you have this um, constraint on the amount of information people can process, right? As the number of possible relationships increases exponentially as you add one more member, you inherently create these systems where people are in different places coming together in these coupled um, systems. And so ultimately this boils down to how do we understand the collaborative processes that are playing out both within the team and also across the team. So with that said, um, when we started working on this problem, we came at it with the idea that the ultimate solution was going to involve leadership. That ultimately this is a problem that we need to study in regard to what we think is going to be able to leverage it and fix it. So I love this quote from um, Craig Kaiser. We assume that leadership is a solution to the problem of collective effort. The problem of bringing people together and combining their efforts towards success and survival in organizations. This was a piece in the American Psychologist where they were critiquing the leadership research, um, arguing that much of the leadership research is really blind to um, effects of leaders on these kind of mid-range phenomenon. Another way to think about this um, early research um, where we looked at leadership in multi-team systems found that it's a complex phenomenon because when you study leadership in a team, it's easier to study leader subordinate relationships when you know exactly who the leader and the subordinates are. But when you're looking at these systems, leadership is playing out at multiple levels simultaneously. So we can't really understand leadership effects in a vacuum because what one leader is doing at one level is directly affecting what's going on at another level. And so our guiding research question for the first study that I'm going to talk about is how internal leadership and external leadership impact the functioning of multi-teams. So this is our original um, taxonomy, and we developed this based on two traditions. And one of them, on the left, you see the locus of leadership. So Fred Morgison and colleagues have a great typology where they lay out the problem of leadership in team, and of course, we're extrapolating to multi-teams, um, is one about understanding what needs to go on with a team and a leader that's part of the team versus a team who's external to the team. And then some work that I did, that's actually a dissertation publication um, with my advisor, Michelle Marks, found that there are essentially two basic functions of leading in a team. One is strategy and planning, um, and another is coordinating and getting people on task. And so we can think about here this le basic leadership framework where you have leaders inside teams, leadership outside teams guiding multiple teams, um, and both collectively, these leaders need to accomplish um, both of these functions. So we sort of propose that the internal leaders of teams will meet the external needs of the system by enacting these two functions. Um, again, this is building on functional leadership theory. And importantly, that external leadership is actually setting the context. So it's not enough to just understand in this, we think back to this oil spill example, what the critical leadership functions are in getting these teams to do what they need to do, but what is the leadership coming down that they're, that's setting the context to either make their actions effective or not. So we do what all good psychologists do, and we make the problem tractable. Um, so we design manipulation based on some theoretical ideas about what should work um, in this so if you look here, this is our research model. Um, the first set of hypothesis was that internal functional team leadership, so having leaders and able to enact these functions within their team, would enable multi-team systems to develop a cognitive architecture that they need to be successful. And let me be more specific. In the team's literature, we often talk about this concept called transactive memory, that teams need to know a lot of stuff. Right, and it's inefficient for everybody to know everything. What's efficient is for different people to specialize their expertise, and then for there to be a common retrieval system where team members can efficiently access, know who's an expert of what information. So one of the ideas here is that we can 
um, raise that construct up and think about in a multi-team system, part of the challenge is not getting everyone to have the same view, but creating this distributed memory system where teams understand what the critical functions and expertise of the other teams are. And so we propose first that um, we can extrapolate that relationship from the team level to the multi-team level. Second, hypotheses two and three propose that the context, the leadership being enacted hierarchically from external leaders is going to shape the effectiveness of what team leaders do. So when external leaders are engaging in the strategy function, right, that will enable the effectiveness of team when these two are in alignment. The same thing with the coordination function. So most things in organizations work that way, right? We have this kind of alignment logic. If everybody's aligned with everybody else and um, form follows function, right, we could pull from architecture, that um, that operations will work more smoothly. So that was our uh, hypothesis, um, that having this cognitive architecture at the system level would enable effective communication across the boundaries of different teams, that that would enable effective intelligence sharing. Um, I'll explain more about that in a second. And then ultimately, these systems would perform better to the extent that they had this. So this was a study to identify these basic relationships to look at the impact and influence of leadership when it's coming from multiple levels of a collective at the same time. Um, we, we did what all good psychologists do, again, um, and we set up a laboratory task where we could model some of the core fundamental processes of these systems in a highly controlled setting, and we could randomly assign and uh, look at what happens under different conditions. So the data I'm presenting here, these are 78 multi-team systems. Um, with 468 people total, they went through, each MTS went through a four and a half hour testing session. Um, it was a two by two by two repeated measures design. So it was a mixed design with um, where we manipulated internal sort of team leadership by having a control in an experimental condition that was between subjects. So there were two team leaders in our multi-team system who either were trained in these functions or not. Then we manipulated the, in a between subjects design, the co um, command level hierarchical leaders engaging in this planning function. And then we also manipulated in a repeated measures fashion, leaders, external leaders engaging in that. Um, this was a cross-functional multi-team system. There were actually 19 teams, two three-person teams were people. Um, and then 17 of the teams were scripted in this uh, PC-based game, World in Conflict. So we took a strategy game and modified it into a multi-team task where we could track these processes. Um, this is how we measured things. So first, our manipulations, internal team leadership was manipulated by having a training manipulation. So we randomly assigned leaders to conditions, and they either were in the control condition where they were taught to lead their teams to synchronize within the team, or they were taught to do that same function both within the team and also across team. Um, then we had an external system manipulation, which was a Confederate commander. And so we created two briefings, um, a control briefing and an experimental briefing. In one condition, this was the overall multi-team system leader coming in um, for the planning control conditions saying, this is what the plan is. These are how the teams are going to do their job. The only difference in the control and the experimental condition was whether that external leader led the teams directly in how to plan for multi-team interaction or not. They gave them actually the exact same plan. Um, and literally in this video, it was a matter of shuffling. the. So in the control condition, the leader would say, this team over here, this is what you're going to do. And they would go through the whole mission and explain, you're going to do this at this point in time, this at this point in time. And then this team, this is what you're going to do. They gave the exact, we used the exact same script. So in the experimental condition, what they did is they went through it in time sequence, but explained to one team what they were going to do, and then explained to the other team what they were going to do. Um, the coordinating manipulation was implemented through commander information that they got while they were working on their task. So they got information um, about their team's performance, or they also got information in the experimental condition about the overall, the extent to which they were coordinating with the other team. Um, these are manipulation check results. So 
We had scales assessed the extent to which participants perceived that their leaders were doing these things differently. Um, and the manipulation checks indicate that these clearly worked in the intended direction. We measured multi-team transactive memory by adjusting the Lewis um, scale to change the referent from being the team to being the multi-team system. Cross-boundary communication was, um, we used TeamSpeak to have the teams talking to each other, and we aggregated for how much time those pro every channel that involved somebody on one team sending information to someone on another team. Um, the intelligence sharing was a more of a cognitive embedded measure of each team had these um, maps, and we could look at, as they were gathering intelligence, they were trying to figure out their part of the task. And we literally just calculated a percent of overlap of the extent to which what one team thinks is what's going on in this area is what another th team thinks is going on. And distal performance, we had a convoy of supplies that was moving through this region. Um, and what the teams were basically doing was disabling bombs that were lit. So this was a province that had been disrupted by a series of wars and now um, we needed to get humanitarian supplies in. And so these were teams that had some specialized expertise in getting rid of bad guys and disabling bombs. Um, and so our ultimate performance outcome was how far this convoy could move safely um, without being destroyed. So these were our findings. Um, first of all, the variables on the left are all manipulations. Um, so these are ANOVA results. We ex In multi-team transactive memory, we're explaining 24% of the variance based on the combination of these leadership manipulation conditions. Um, we also found, I, I'll, I'll give you the result and then I'll show you the result. So remember I said we predicted this alignment pattern, that what leaders needed to do needed to be in alignment with each other. You needed a multi-team leader that explained the teams needed to work together. Then you needed team leaders that were trained to know how to get teams to work with other teams, right? Um, we actually found an interesting um, interaction effect here. So I'll come back to that pattern. But these interaction patterns are explaining significant variance in the extent to which they're developing multi-team effective memory. That's related to the amount of communication that's going across the team. So when they understand what the expertise of each team is, they send them information. Um, that's related, the extent to which they send them information, to the extent to which they have a common understanding of what's going on and they share intelligence. Um, and that's a real beta weight on a zero to one scale explaining that convoy movement. So I promised you interesting effects um, here with leadership. So this was our, our examination of the interplay between at the top what an external hierarchical overall leader is doing and what a team leader is doing. And again, we expected that basically more was better. If they were both in the experimental condition, that would be the best. You have a command leader that's setting the stage for these teams to work together, and you have a team leader who knows how to. Um, we actually found a neutralizer effect. So if we think back to old leadership theory, Kerr and Jeremiah substitutes and neutralizers um, for leadership, we find this interesting context effect. So if you look on the left, um, or if you look at that dotted line, that's the experimental condition of the coordinate, the, the command level experimental leadership, right? So training leaders, which is across the bottom, this is the control condition for team leadership and the experimental condition. It, if we trained the team leaders, but they were under the influence, this command leader had set the stage for these teams to work together, it completely neutralized the effects of the team leader's job. Right? Whatever they did was no longer effective. Um, on the other hand, it worked exactly like we would have expected, only if they were in the control condition. Right? So we're seeing that if the command leaders didn't prompt the teams to work together, but the team leaders had that training, that benefited multi performance. It's almost this rigidity explanation. Right? That having command level leadership pushing something down is making them less, the teams less responsive to what their team leaders are doing, which is inherently, by virtue of the fact that they're embedded within the teams, more reactive and receptive to what their task demands are. Right? A commander can come in in advance and say, this is the plan, um, but it's subject to change. Um, so 
Next, we looked at the extent to which what those external leaders were doing was not advanced planning, but actually during the mission of the team, providing them with information that would help the teams work together. And in this case, we found an enhancer effect, which is the opposite, that actually if we look at these same conditions, that straight line is the mutual adjustment control. So team leadership did not help these teams, right, unless they were also getting that same leadership during the real time. And they needed both levels of leadership um, provide, reinforcing each other. Um, so some new insights from this into leadership. Functional leadership is clearly important. This idea that there is a strategy function and a coordination function that needs to be met to get people working on the same page. And that ex they're not all um, these neat relationships that we would predict, that there are these significant context effects. So a leader doing his or her job in the context of what another leader's doing is obviously sound, right, is going to, to either enhance or neutralize the effects of that leader. Um, some insights into organization, this multi-team level transactive memory system had a potent effect on enabling these teams to communicate across boundaries. In field work, um, when we were originally formulating multi-team systems, one of the big observations was that even if you had, you know, we would watch these military exercises where they get people together in a big room and they do an activity, even with, with teams in the same room, um, in a high stress, high pressure situation with lots of uncertainty and information, they ignore each other. They focus, let me focus on what I'm doing and do it well and not share information. Um, I love this example. I did this lab study when I was a graduate student and we had a multi-team system comprised of two teams of two and they sat in the same room, communicated through computers um, and we had a little switch box that they could flip to talk to the other team or not. And we would go through all this training and, and we would manipulate whether they were trained to engage in process and we had these sophisticated designs. And then as soon as we let the teams go to perform their mission, they would say, this is too confusing, turn the communication off, right? And completely do their own things. But they were playing an F-22 fighter jet and one team was flying a plane and they only had missiles that could lock onto enemy airplanes. The other team was flying a plane in the same place they only had missiles that could shoot at stuff on the ground, launching missiles up. So you would have this team that was getting shot at by missiles from the ground, flying the plane. Heaven forbid they would turn the switch and tell the other team to shoot the enemy. Right. It was too challenging. So it was a clear kind of entree that um, gaining this coordination going on simultaneously is, is not automatic. So we wanted to then extend this another step. So in essence, a lot of attention recently in leadership has been on reframing the role of leadership as not being enacted by a person, right? So if you have a team of people, why do we have to have a leader? In a highly structured team, you have a leader, but sometimes it's a self-managing team and everybody does it. If what needs to happen is they need to plan, two people could plan. They could rotate leadership. They could distribute leadership. So we wanted to look at the relative utility of vertical leadership, which I'll call traditional leadership. You have a leader of a team um, versus collective leadership, where it's where it's a patterned interaction of multiple people leading the team. And next, we wanted to test more context effects. So does the relative utility of forms of leadership depend on the architecture of the MTS? And we wanted to look at two specific aspects. So the classic group studies, right, which argue that the two basic things that need to make a team work, anyone remember them? Everyone remembers. Ask and people, right? So we go through this. We can go back to Tuckman's work or the forming, storming, or, and there's two leaders that emerge, and one does task and one does relationships, right? So um, what we wanted to look at is we can extend that logic and think that essentially the reason for that, for thinking that way, is that a group needs two things to happen. One is they need to be able to do whatever it is that they're tasked to do. They need some task structure that's conducive to performing. Second, they need to be able to stay together, right? If they can't stay together, then they're not going to be very viable for very long. Um, so both of those functions need to get met. So what we did is we ex first extended the space of thinking about locus of leadership and functions of leadership to enact this idea of forms that leadership can take. It can be vertical. It can be also collective. 
Um, and next was to extend this idea of structural contingency theory to propose that these relationships between leadership arrangements and the properties that make teams work depend on the structural properties that the systems are working in. And by structural properties, I think we can conceptualize these both as things like communication structures, who's talking to who, and also the extent to which there's a trust structure in place where lots of people trust each other versus where there are strategic points of distrust. Um, and that this would enable MTS performance. So we propose that um, there would be a different effect between leadership arrangements and I call these cross-team emergent characteristics. This is my big bucket label for the stuff that makes multiple teams able to work together. Affect, behavior, cognition. They have to trust each other. They have to identify with the larger mission. They have to actually talk to each other, exchange intelligence, synchronize what they're doing with each other. They have to have this multi-team transactive memory where they understand what the other team's jobs are. Um, and the second property that we think affects this relationship is the communication structure. And here we were looking at a centralized versus a decentralized structure. Um, our participants, this data is literally still being collected. Um, so this is the hot off the press finding. Um, we have 66 multi-team systems. We're going to stop at 120. Or or when the graduate students convince me otherwise. Um, so this is 396 people in a four and a half hour testing session. This MTS modeled a cross-functional MTS comprised of 22 teams. There were two two-person live teams um, and two one-person teams with a confederate. That's sort of an oxymoron. There were two one-person teams. Um, so the structure actually had four teams of two, right? But what we did in order to economize on the subject pool was make two, one member of each of two of the teams a simulated member. So because these teams were all working through a computer, um, we were able to send information as though that person was real. Um, so we pulled out part of the social dynamic. Um, we used the same simulation. Here our design was fully crossed between subjects. Um, two levels of leadership, either vertical or collective. Two trust patterns, either they trusted each other across teams or they did not and a centralized versus the decentralized communication structure. In the leadership condition, um, we created this by, by training those leadership functions that we know are important, either to one uh, member of each of the teams. So let's, for the sake of this discussion, let's imagine that three people, we'll, we'll leave out the Confederates, are doing one task and three people are doing another task and they need to work together. One person is gets the training from this team to do leadership and one person gets it over here. In the collective condition, everybody got trained. In neither condition did we say who the leader was, right? It was just you're all a team and you all need to work together. But we infused the training either so that it could be centralized in a person or it was distributed. Um, then we manipulated the trust structure. So we created trust among everyone. And then we either um, let them continue trusting each other or we broke the bonds of trust across the team. And the way that we did that was by having them, before they do their task, create, um, they would say, how much effort are you going to put towards your team? How much effort are you going to put towards? So they had some resource points that they would allocate. Um, and then they would sort of do the task. And this was a practice task, right, where we weren't actually recording. And at the end of the task, they would be given information that said, this is what the other team said that they were going to do. And this is what they were actually going to do. They were thinking that they were getting real information, but they were not. They were getting information that we either it was a, the team said they were going to do this and they did exactly this. And it was um, it was true. Or in the distrust condition, they said they were going to work and help the other team, but actually they didn't. So they believed that. And we checked that with the manipulation. Um, the communication structure was manipulated. Um, they were assigned either to a centralized or decentralized structure. And we did that by breaking the communication channel. So um, we only allowed them to, so during the practice, they all could talk. But then we created this mission where we would put them in the task based on their condition and either allow them to talk in a centralized pattern or put them in the decentralized pattern. Um, this is what the task looked like. So we had a, the top, a UN ghost team whose goal was to neutralize insurgents, a talent team neutralizing IEDs, a phantom team neutralizing insurgents, a singer team neutralizing IEDs. Um, 
first two teams were from the UN, the second two teams were from the US. So in this way, they had these multiple foci of identity. We tracked um, team performance, their unit goals, which were these convoy distances, but we were most interested in the, this multi-team goal, which if you think about their task, right, they're in this region and they're trying to get, ultimately the US has some convoys of US officials that they're trying to safely get through this area. The UN has some convoys of their officials that they're trying to safely get through this area. But ultimately, the whole reason that they're there is to save lives by getting these humanitarian supplies safely through, and that requires coordination between the US and the UN. Um, so we tested this idea of multi-team structural contingency theory, um, and here's what we found. So this is a plot. I could show you all of the analyses, but I think these are the most interesting patterns. Um, first, if we look at, there was a significant interaction between communication structure and trust structure, right? So again, they were either centralized or decentralized, and they trusted a, the other team or they did not trust the other team. Notice what bar is the highest. What condition was that? Highly centralized distrust. Okay, so the best teams didn't trust each other, right? And again, they all trust each other. They started out, we systematically broke it. They perceived it. Um, so this has a lot of conceptual meaning, right? We're in a lot of conversations and we talk to people, emergency managers. Well, we just don't, we need to build trust. Um, the military, how do we build these multinational collaborations and get everybody to trust each other, right? That was our goal going in too. Let's figure out how to foster this. Let's look at how the MTS performs under this versus that. We didn't expect to find this. Um, so actually, the best performing teams were highly centralized. And by the way, there's also a bias towards how do we create decentralized organizations and get them to work together, right? That's certainly the push, um, right, in organizations. Let's be flatter. Let's be leaner. Everybody um, is engaged in this empowerment. Um, that's not, right, all other things being equal, that's not the highest performing team. Um, so here we find this interesting interaction. Now it raises the question why, right? You're wondering why. Um, so we looked at a bunch of mechanisms and we found actually that the amount of cross-team communication fully mediates this effect, right? So what happens is when you break the trust ties and they don't trust each other, they talk more. And we just found in study one that that was needed in order for them to succeed. Um, so that psycho, so, so it's, there's actually, at the team level, we have lots of research that shows that trust is critical, right? If you want a team to perform well, people have to trust each other, or they're not going to um, subjugate what they want as an individual for the good of the team, right? Basic collectivist thinking. Um, actually, we're finding there's a strategic um, nature to distrust, that, I, that while it might be critical for a team, that when there is this mixed motive situation, that having some distrust may actually be, may have some benefit. Now, we also found an interesting pattern. We looked at le the match of leadership and communication. So one of the movements in organizations is let's understand this phenomenon of collective leadership because um, this is incredibly valuable. If we can build teams where people are all substitutable, right, and they can be self-empowered and everybody can lead, that has advantages, having specific people in these dominant roles. We actually found here that, that, that leadership structures need to match communication structures, right? So in the high centralization condition, vertical leaders outperform. The teams that are organized with vertical leadership outperform the teams that didn't. Um, on the other hand, when it's decentralized, collective leadership is better. Having everybody on the team enabled to mutually enact those leadership functions um, is more beneficial to multi and the DV and all of these multi-team performance. So a couple of insights, um, functional leadership seems to have a third dimension. So we can think of the locus of activities, we can think of the functions that leaders engage in, but we also need to think of the form, of the structure, of who's engaging in leadership. And that le these leadership forms need to align with communication structures. In terms of organization, that optimal coordination communication structures depend on trust, right? In this case, if the teams do not trust each other, putting them in a centralized pattern will be much more effective. Having teams that don't trust each other be decentralized um, isn't good for performance. 
Now, what do we think, right, most organizations in, in climates of distrust wouldn't necessarily think this, right? It's, it's push power down, decentralize people. Um, that can have unintended consequences. So we also need to reconsider the role of trust within versus across teams. Um, those of us who do multi-level research like to think in terms of homologous relationships, right? We have a construct relationship at one level of analysis, trust to performance, and whether we scale it up or scale it down, we expect that trust enables people to work together and we could extend the unit of analysis. This is one case. Um, and we know that works with coordination, by the way. It doesn't work with trust. So there actually can be um, a more complex socio-emotive structure to a multi-team system that involves these discontinuous relationships. The next direction, um, we're engaged, we need future research on these complex team structures, considering these multi-dimensional views of um, functioning. So a lot of the focus on multi-team systems has been on, in research, has been on coordination, Wrote getting behaviors to align with each other. Um, but arguably, a lot of what determines the ultimate fate of these systems is determined by their motivational inclinations to work together, not just about having the technology to do it. They also need to have the desire to do it um, and the motivation. They also need to have, right, notice we gave them this communication structure, but depending on whether they trusted each other, it either was helpful or detrimental. Um, so these things are interfering, are, are influencing each other. We need to pay a lot more attention to the patterning of these multidimensional not just look at things like the amount. Um, and so my conclusion is that I think what happens matters less than we think, right? It's much more about how things happen. So a couple of ideas. Um, when we're thinking about information sharing. There's been tons of research and teams it talks about information sharing and we focus on what they share, whether they're sharing common information or unique information. But we really need to think about who's sharing information, who they're sharing it with, and when they're sharing. Right? That's much more a question of pattern than it is amount or even amount of what type. In terms of leadership, this suggests a shift away from thinking about what a leader does to thinking about the pattern of how leadership is being enacted within a complex system. And third, when we study affect and motivation, we need to move away from thinking about just how much trust we, do we create, right? I was at this um, NATO conference two weeks ago, and we had this panel on comprehensive approach to operations, and we spent a whole day in the room with NGOs and diplomats um, engaged in comprehensive operations, right? And everyone's saying, well, the problem is trust. We just, if we could just get everyone to trust each other, you know, we could fix the situation in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, may not be that simple, right? The solution really may be in strategically positioning trust at certain points and recognizing that some levels of distrust can actually create an equilibrium that's healthy, right? It can stimulate some competition. You can come up with some more creative ideas. And it's really spurs some interesting ideas for future research about these patterns of trust and distrust. Um, and I just want to thank all of my great collaborators. The first three at the top, this was funded research with co-PIs John Matthew at University of Connecticut Business School, Christian Reese at Drexel Business School, and Sean Burke, who's at UCF in the Institute for Simulation and Training. And that's my smiling face lab. Um, and it's my great doctoral students who helped make this happen. So, slide. So, questions? Did I? I think that's a really interesting question. So one domain, this is, this is a very action oriented, right? You have a timeline, there's kind of a known solution, right, of what it should look like. 
But when you think about innovation, can you argue that information exchange is any less critical? Right. So I think that competitive, I think the phenomenon here is really this cooperation. That when you have different teams um, working on some problem, that to some extent, even take science teams, multiple labs at multiple universities working together, to some extent, it's good that they're competitive with each other. Right. That create, we know that creates arousal, that creates energy. It's, it creates a pressure to do a good job. And if we think about the distribution of labor in a large collective, right, just think about that curve. I love that line. So if you take everyone in this room formula, right, how many people are on a team? How many dyadic exchanges is it, right? And times the minus one, two. And then you look at what that, so you add a team member across the bottom and you look at the number of possible relationships and it goes like this, right? That's the basic problems in teams. You cannot create tight coupling as those numbers go up. So it's really about understanding how to nurture certain behaviors with that require tight coupling at certain places and enable loose coupling but coupling right at other levels. So I think that it applies because of the information aspect, but I think that's also one of the most interesting where there's not a you know science teams there isn't a known solution. That's the whole point. Um, Over the long run, yeah. yeah. It might be, if any of you have done like a negotiations class and seen the oil pricing game, has anyone played the oil pricing game? Um, well, it's a popular negotiation. I think it's, it's a Harvard or Kellogg exercise. Um, and you put people in teams and they set prices and basically they create these little markets. And there's, you know, it's set up like a prisoner's dilemma where there's an incentive to compete, to say you're going to do one thing and do something else. And when you run it over multiple iterations in a class, right, at first it's highly beneficial um, to lie, cheat, and steal, right? But over the long run, it becomes detrimental because the other team will basically completely leave the market, go bankrupt, lose, just to inflict pain. Um, to the people on the other side, like, how can I, you know, what's the way the instructor's grading? And okay, I'm going to make their move because I stepped out of the market, right? Um, so it's the same kind of thing. So I think the time horizon is probably critical there. Um, that's something we can look at in one iteration, but that's certainly a boundary condition that needs to be looked at. You know, what level, it's probably more curvilinear, right? Like what level of distrust can create a little enough disequilibrium, but it's like an equilibrium, just equilibrium. If it's too much and too intense, it, it's unsustainable, right? And the, the system would dissolve. I'm not sure I understand your question. So what do you mean by managing resources? Got 
Have they acquired those resources? No, they acquired them, but now they might. I don't think we've looked at that. I mean, I think it's a good question, and I think maybe certain characteristics, dispositions of people and tendencies um, could create that, but we haven't looked at that. We're actually, um, we're starting to do more with looking at the, the traits and characteristics of people and how they're patterned. In make, so we have some interesting findings about the matches and traits. So um, one of them is that um, the extent to which um, people like followers, the per certain aspects of personality are congruent with each other will affect. So if I'm extroverted, if you have a team of relative extroverts, extroversion is one thing um, that conveys promise as a leader and people in teams perceive it as being important. So there may be ways to subtly signal that in these Wikipedia environments that would increase the chances that that person would acquire it. But I think characteristics would matter, relative characteristics, not just raw levels of certain things, but how it is enacted in it in the context, right? You can never take leadership and understand it without understanding the followers and the organizational drivers that the leader is operating with. Right. You know what? We haven't done that, but we're going to. Like, I think we finished these analyses two weeks ago. Um, I, you know, I wanted to have a right. Not two hours ago, but two weeks ago. Um, so we wanted to, have, you know, like I said, we're actually doubling this data set, but a, we're collecting a lot of that information. Um, so definitely. And certainly communication is this, per, it's a complete mediator of that effect. Um, but we also have much more information about um, other potential effects, like the extent to which that distrust breaks the identity of they no longer identify with um, or it, it's it refocuses their effort on different parts of the task and actually might be making them collab more in tune to what the other person needs and why they should be collaborating. Okay. No, I think what it could do, and again, this is, I'm totally speculating, making this up. Um, just put that out there. All right, so I'll make it up. So I could imagine that the fact it's made salient, the fact that you need, right, now that this other team isn't working with you, the reason that that bothers you is because you think you need their help. So that may also erode your identification with your team and make you more willing and focusing on building that relationship, right, because of the fact that it's now become salient that there's a break. Right. Whereas when it's trust, it's it's not it doesn't get your attention. We trust each other. OK, I assume that they're and I think that's the norm. You're working in a big or, you know, everybody's got their part to do. I assume that everybody's working for the common good. I am right. Or maybe I'm a little bit competitive, but heaven forbid they're not. Um, and so I think the distrust makes the larger identity salient and the need. You know, if there is, in fact, an inherent need to work together, it, that it would raise attention. But I don't know. I mean, we have data to test that. We're going to look at that mechanism. Mm -hmm. 
I love that idea. And while you were saying that, it made me think maybe they're not afraid to be more directive, right? Because they're not as concerned, like you already don't value me. So what, what have I got to lose? I'm going to tell you, I need you here now and I don't care what you need to be doing. That's very cool. No, none. Yes, I mean, they watch this video. So we have this nice, you know, LCD projector comes down in a room like this, and it's there's music playing. You're a task force Delta. And you're, ta you know, and they show like these provinces, and we have very creative students in our lab who make up names for them, you know, that aren't real places or people, but kind of, so it's, you know, here you are in this province and people need your help. And, um, the, you know, you're going to go in in this multinational task force I mean, units from the UN and the US and they're going to work together. And so they're given, they have reason to value all of those levels. We have different videos, one that's meant to, you're on this team, your team has a long tradition of success. You've been in all these prior missions before, you've done really well. Now you've been asked to join this task force. You also have division. You're part of the U.S. The U.S. is successful, blah, blah, blah. So we create all salient, but we don't actually tell them you should work towards the task force and not because we want that behavior to vary. It's possible. It's possible. We ask, yes, we interrupt them a, million, a lot um, and ask them a lot of how many items, Dan? Yeah, so like 800 responses in four and a half hours. Um, but we cheerlead and, you know, come on, read this carefully. Um, but we, we get them to, to do it. But it could. I mean, the, the, it's not going to explain these patterns because these are experimental manipulations with random assignment and everyone's exposed to the same conditions. But you're right that it could, um, if there were an interaction between priming those measures and one of the conditions, that, that could certainly. Indeed. Um, No, we didn't, but I think that's one of the most interesting directions. Right here, these are... It, also, I think what's neat about that is these teams are parallel in workload um, and they're all engaged at the same time. But oftentimes, if we really think about the oil, kind of the framing of what problem we're trying to solve, some people are engaged in the task and they're in a different time zone and they're not working at exactly the same time or teams are rotating. Some teams are overloaded. Um, those things get more and more complex in the lab. So we need people who do ethnographic research. To um, put boots on the ground and um, reveal that. So, Did we? I don't think we did. Yeah, that's not in this iteration. That's that's not in the. That's coming. 
phase three. And We said we did. We do explain the goal hierarchy. So we explain you're part of this team. You're, the team is working to help this division get the division thing done. But ultimately, what's trying, what needs to happen here is that you're here for this task force to accomplish this mission. So they understand that. Um, you know, in this case, we didn't want to be so explicit as to say, you know, if you're here and you know you're doing your task, you really should just every all effort should go. I think we did. Goal commitment. We have yeah. We have a multi-level goal commitment scale in there. Like to what extent do you is it important to accomplish being Yeah, we need to look at that. Again, this is kind of preliminary, um, which it's more fun because I just got so many ideas from you all. I would much rather show you this than the final latest, greatest, fully analyzed, understood. Yes, we controlled for 82,000 things. There's the 74 mediators. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. So thank you for the. I want to again thank you as we enjoy.